Thank you, Richard, for joining us for the second part of our talk. Again, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. Different people around the world sharing with us their opinion, ideas, and thoughts. Richard, can you share with us what is your artistic approach for art, sculpture, and fabrication? I make sculpture. And I think since I was, uh, uh, I've only really ever been interested in making sculpture. I've never really been interested in making paintings. Uh, I like drawing. And I started making sculpture when I was at school. First, there was an after-school art class uh, that was allowed you to make a sculpture, to mess around with materials. And when I went there, uh, it was down in the basement and it was uh, kind of dusty and stuff. And there was funny, there was plaster and wood uh, and other bits and pieces. And when I started there, it was like I suddenly thought, oh, so this is what I've been doing. Um, so I'd always messed around with bits of materials and, and joined stuff together and uh, uh, played around. And it never really had a home. So it was like I found a home. Um, and uh, my approach, I think, has always been to do with manipulating materials without necessarily knowing to why I want to manipulate them. So I came from a family where my uh, uh, my father was very skilled, as a mechanically skilled, and so was my brother. Um, but I was never any good at making stuff that worked. But uh, uh, but I did like messing around, and I didn't necessarily like applying the right tool to the right material, um, which could cause tensions. I've been interested in the world, and sculpture seemed to be a way of of being able to. Uh, look at the world in, in a very particular way. Uh, and my approach has been uh, founded on that, really, on, on the fact that um, my practice as an artist um, is rooted or has its foundations uh, in uh, manipulation of material. Making sculpture was always a bit different because it was always, uh, I had a sense that the uh, I was exploring something that was based in my experience, uh, that it was a route to explore uh, my experience, investigating it. Before the next question, I'm inviting you, if you haven't done yet, to be a part of this project. You can do so by going to the virtual experience, available by the link below, and share with the world by recording or a photo a significant moment that happened to you in the last two years. I would like to ask, how has the notion of fabrication came to your work and what did it mean to you? This started from a um, sometime in the early 80s to do with a, um, an exhibition at the Tate Gallery, the Tate Britain, um, when I was trying to write a, um, a little introduction to, to myself. Uh, the exhibition was, a, um, it was called Making Sculpture. Uh, and it involved uh, two of us working side by side in these little kind of open fronted studios, like a bit like on the stage. Or, and uh, I was then starting to reflect a bit on what I could say about my practice and whether it had any coherence. Uh, and what I said was uh, that I didn't carve and I didn't model and uh, uh, but that I was a, a fabricator, by which I meant I put things uh, I put things together, uh, and it was a the, it was a kind of sculpture was a kind of a for me sculpture was a kind of constructive assembly activity, and that's and that was what I thought was the initial meaning of fabricator for me. As English is a slippery language, uh, so fabricator uh, it is also um, somebody who makes things up, um, and. Uh, uh, and it can be an insulting term. You can say, you know, that's a complete fabrication. If you're talking about um, someone trying to give an excuse, you know, I, the dog ate my homework or whatever, you know. It's a, um, uh, so it has a fantasy element or a kind of made-up element to it. And I liked the... the so it, on the one hand, I'm a fabricator, has a kind of artisanal... Uh, um, 
hands-on quality to it, which is sort of really uh, nitty gritty. Uh, but on the other hand, it also um, implies you make things up, you know, you just, uh, there's no truth attached to whatever it is that you're trying to do. Uh, and that dialogue between uh, assembly and uh, invention, or even, even if you like, uh, fiction, was something that I I liked, and I liked the uh, the fact that it, um, it removed the idea of truth telling from the work, and it you could be lying as well as telling the truth. Can you tell me how art and sculpture able you to connect with the world? I think that um, the world's made of material, and I think that the uh, the plasticity of what making sculpture enables you to do is to access the plasticity of the world so that you're engaged with the uh, um, uh, with the substance of the world and the uh, plasticity both is responsive to your actions um, but also is located in the real world so the sculpture exists in this kind of funny place between uh, um, what's out there and what's in here um, and uh, uh, and it kind of mediates that exchange it's not sculpture isn't telling you how to do anything it's not really uh, giving you any instructions about how material behaves or anything but it does uh, enable you to to attach yourself to the world, attach yourself to uh, the material, the material fact of existence. We're doing work for ourselves. Where the that's the excuses that they're for other people, but actually they're for ourselves. You know that's, uh, and if you're really lucky, um, somebody else likes them or finds it interesting. What you have to say, uh, I don't think my motivation is at its root anything. To, I'm not a doctor. So I'm not I'm not out to heal the world. Um, uh, I'm a selfish individual, uh, and uh, but I also get enormous amount of um, enrichment from uh, the activities of artists across cultures and across uh, uh, across time. And I think they help me to be. I'm not a guide. I'm not a leader, but I am. Um, actually very dependent on the responses of others. It's not so much what I do for them, but what they do for me. Can you share with us what is for you the inner and outer relationship experience in the process of the work? Oh, well, I mean, <clears throat> you asked about the inner and outer, and there is obviously a paradox between uh, your experience of the world outside and your notion of yourself as a living being. And uh, subjectivity, objectivity, I mean, it's a funny thing, you know, that if you take something simple like experience of colour. So I can talk about red and you know what I mean, but you and I don't have any, uh, there's no commonality to our experience of red. The, the point of breakdown between experience and description, you know, it's something that is, that crosses the... Uh, intersubjective barrier you know it doesn't exist in the world really it's a uh it's an it's a fun phenomena that comes out of reflected light and red doesn't exist it, it's uh, uh it's the way that a surface reflects uh light but you and i both experience red uh, and if i say that's red you can say you say yeah but it's a bit orange and actually i know what you mean can you tell us how collaboration work started for you and what do you find in it interesting? Uh, I've always liked collaborations. Uh, there was a point when I thought I had to do everything myself. But then at some point, I also realized that I didn't have to do everything myself. Uh, and what was kind of interesting was the first time I uh, went to a, um, a workshop of uh, fabricators to talk about doing something. Uh, I realized that actually the experience that I've had with working, this was really working with sheet metal, um, involved the uh, some of the same problems that they addressed all the time 
and my and some of the solutions I'd come at were in keeping with that. Um, and in a way, you know, I use a lot of um, fixing devices, screws, rivets, uh, etc. Um, and you don't have to be the one that puts them in. You know, it doesn't make a difference who. Well, it might do. It might do. Uh, uh, but I didn't think it really made a difference between who put the screw in or didn't. But I, uh, the difference is that I think there's a um, that the screw is something that unites two sides of an object, um, and and you can use it to mark the inside and the outside, or you can use it the wrong way around and have the screw heads on the inside and the points on the outside. So both of us pay attention to how you put the screw in. But I might also be thinking about how that screw or stitch or whatever uh, makes a connection between the two sides of an object. So if you if you need to join something together and you put three screws in uh, and that does the job, then the screws, but then if you put 40 screws in to screw it together, then it's kind of overdetermined. And then the functionality of the screw becomes uh, redundant or becomes a kind of, a, becomes something that, Flops over into meaning, rather than it being just this thing that holds two things together. So it, the uh, uh, excess liberates meaning in that. Can you share with us what were your experience in Corona time in the UK and around? The last trip I made before Corona was to Berlin in uh, early February 2020. Then the, the information was just coming out of Wuhan about there's something going on. And interestingly, uh, because I've worked in China and I have uh, uh, a number of Chinese friends, they wrote to me and said, something's coming and it's really bad. Look after yourself. Uh, and if you like, we'll send you some masks. Uh, and they did. Uh, so the interesting takeout from that is that the Chinese were very well informed about the pandemic at quite an early stage. And that they, between themselves, had worked out that this was going to be quite a bad situation. And uh, 2020... It was a, f you didn't know, it could have, uh, you didn't really know it was going to stop. The health service was, uh, there were no flights anywhere. The skies had gone quiet. Uh, the roads were quiet. Uh, I left London because uh, I got a house out in the country. I could go out for walks or I could even I could go out in my garden. Again. So I was, you know, I felt um, I didn't feel endangered particularly. Whereas if you're in a, if the way you validate yourself is to do with, uh, with going into work every day and you can't go into work every day, then you have a, it's quite a big dis disruption. Uh, and obviously there were people who were kind of suddenly stuck at home in small flats with uh, uh, big families and that were really in a kind of bad situation. There were health workers uh, working night and day, you know, on, uh, on stuff. And there was a, uh, there was this big thing in like going out every week and kind of uh, clapping for the health workers uh, one evening a week, uh, which was which was uh, happened all over the country. You know, people came out in the streets and clapped, um, and you sort of said thank you to the dust cart workers who were still turning up to work and moving your you know, your stuff away. And uh, shopping was the first time I went out for a big shop in uh, the supermarket. The queue was, they were only letting like two or three people in at a time. So the queue was enormous, but incredibly well friendly. But everyone spaced apart uh, and a queue kind of going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, uh, and slowly moving along. Um, and really, it's quite like contemporary dance. These, uh, these cues you've probably seen the same at airports when there's a uh, when you have that kind of wound up queue for it to get to the passport all those people moving in different directions uh, and I think it is quite close to a kind of dance activity uh, a lot of people bought dogs 
there's a lot a lot more people walking dogs. So I think the population of dogs must have increased kind of you know by whatever, you know. Um a lot of fathers spent more time with the children. You could see that too. You know, they were uh which I thought was a nice thing to see. You see fathers out with their which they wouldn't have they wouldn't have got to do otherwise. I mean, I think there's a lot of negatives for children from the two year period. But uh I think there are also been some positives in the different ways that uh the fam families have had to kind of behave together. Uh I also have to say the way that nature came back into both the urban and the uh, rural environments was quite striking that animals became less afraid uh, and returned into towns villages and in london you could see animals on the street as well as out in the country it was, uh, so that was interesting too can you share with us what was the impact on you as a working artist on this time economically between march 2020 and march 2021 um yeah i'd say it was a complete disaster i have one person who works for me all the time justinia my archivist i kept her on at without reducing her hours and it was good that she was coming into the to the studio two days a week as she does normally uh, it can make sure that you know the studio kept on ticking over how did you continue communicating with people on this time? I wrote a lot of emails and I wrote a lot of letters. Um, I'm not great at phone calls, um, whereas I do like writing letters. Um, and uh, I always have liked, uh, liked writing letters uh, and emails. But, you know, so with the family, we kind of kept in touch uh, and made sure we were all okay. Um, they looked out for me probably more than I looked out for them, but, you know, um, and uh, friends, I actually have friends in quite a lot of different countries. Uh, and I did reach out to, to a lot of them to find out how they were getting on. I got my first vaccination in uh, January 2021, and so it's very fast. Uh, and that was so. But at that point, we starting to seem like maybe this could, maybe this could stop. Can you share with us a significant moment that happened to you all this time? During COVID, uh, the most difficult thing was um, having a very good friend on the point of death. Uh, and that was tough. It wasn't tough for me as it was for him. I mean, he was, <laughs> he was, well, he was suffering, but, uh, and, well, you hear good stories, you know. So um, another friend, her husband's a uh, a top surgeon, does transplants, does, he's, he's a, you know, really top, but he couldn't work. So, uh, so he went to work as a nurse um, in a COVID hospital, and then he caught COVID, and then, the guy who looks after my eyes, I have glaucoma. He went off to work in a hospital for as a also as a nurse. So uh, you hear those things about people who have something to give and that they've given it, uh, and that's really inspiring. Really. What was happening in the art community and art? Uh, now it's going to be really hard to know what's going to happen. The uh, the art world kind of collapsed. Galleries closed, art fairs closed, um, jetting around, and uh, uh, a whole social circle kind of disappeared. The art didn't disappear. You know, and people still liked art and took opportunities to go and see art. For your point of view, what was the relationship between artists to artists in this time? I get on quite well with quite a lot of artists. On the level of artists to artists, the uh, the, si the situation, both during and after the pandemic, has been very friendly, very uh, fraternal. I think is the correct is 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 a good word, uh, and not particularly competitive. But then on the other hand, I don't feel myself particularly in competition with a lot of other artists. 
Now, I think the situation for young artists is really quite difficult because uh, I have some history to draw on and I can sort of rely on that. Whereas if the means of exposure have reduced and you're trying to get something out into the world without having any uh, profile, then it gets tricky, which is why I guess um, this is where kind of like social media get, becomes uh, useful. You know, an old, an old fool like myself doesn't really use social media in the same way as, although I, you know, kind of understand how things are linked together. Uh, I was thinking about an analogy just recently that in the 70s, the art world in Britain was, uh, uh, had no economy and really zero interest in contemporary art. The, there was really zero public interest in contemporary art. So it was a very underground scene. If you had contacts and you were to go, then you could actually see some really interesting things, see some really great art happening. So that worked very well on a kind of underground level. And then it it all became a bit more public in the 90s, kind of the, the kind of explosion of things happening. In, and it's possible that uh, younger artists are connected together in ways that are a bit similar to the ways that we were connected together in the 70s, but which and which I'm not part of. That I don't know. Can you share with us what are your thoughts and reflection about the present? The sense of sharing is something that we can look back on. The destruction of the economy. It's not just COVID, you see. It's a, there's a kind of uh, imperial war going on in Europe, which is just when you thought things were getting better and uh, all this other shit comes along. Actually, funnily enough, now in my mind, I think the conflict in Ukraine is a greater threat than COVID. Uh, and it causes me more anxiety because I have less hope about it than I had about COVID. And partly because the, the COVID thing, the way in which the vaccines were, in, the incredible effort that went into producing the vaccine and the cooperation that um, even on, on, interna on an international level was created by COVID is being fragmented in the Ukraine. I would like to thank you again for our talk. Pleasure. It's nice talking to you. Subscribe below or in the website www.sleepingfortomorrow and for seeing and hearing more talks to get the latest notification of our talk and discussion.